You are listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today, we're in Cherbourg, Octeville. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. We are at the Tour de France and uh, I'm joined by Lionel Burney. Good evening, Richard. I'm making his first appearance this year, uh, hopefully the first of many, Francois Tomaso from Le Figaro. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Very well, Francois. How are you? Welcome back. Well, I'm, I'm shivering, you know. It's, it's pretty cold here in, uh, in France. Uh, it feels a little bit like... Uh, this this remote place known as uh, Britain. <laughs> oh, the first the first one. The oh first dear! One. Oh dear! Okay, all right. Enough of that. Um, <laughs> we'll see if you're laughing uh, tomorrow after tonight's match against Iceland. We'll see. Hopefully. And after we've just wrecked the whole of Europe by sort of stampeding through it like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> anyway, before we, um, we we must say thank you to our sponsors, Rafa. Um, who are sponsoring us at the Tour de France and for the rest of the year. Thank you to them. Uh, where are we, Lionel? Uh, we're at a horse racing course in Cherbourg, or just just outside the port of Cherbourg. We're just a little bit inland, aren't we? Um, I mean, it's not exactly Royal Ascot, I have to say, here. Is this an important horse racing venue or quite a small mm, one, Francois? Th- th- there, are, there are quite a few uh, horse racing venues in Normandy. It's, it's a horse uh, you know, breeding area. So, so you, you've got you know, all, horse racing tracks almost all, all over the place in, the, in this area. But I never heard really uh, Sher- Sherbert you know, mentioned as a major uh, horse uh, racing track. May- maybe I'm wrong, but I, no, well, I don't think so. When you, by, by the look of it, I don't think it is. It might well be your trotting place actually um, I, I'm pretty sure it is if you look at the yeah it's probably trotters you know yeah well it's at the top of the hill isn't it the Côte mm. de la Glacerie it's called the Hippodrome de la Glacerie here isn't it um, yeah I mean it's it's been a chilly drizzly day here but it didn't rain on the riders much today, not did it? They much, got away with much. it, I think. Tell us, though, Lionel, the tale of the attack. OK, stage two, San Lo to Cherbourg, 183 kilometres with a short, sharp climb of the third category, Côte de la Glacerie, very close to the finish. Once again, Bora Argon 18 had two men up the road. Uh, the King of the Mountain and Peddler de Charme, Paul Voss, was joined by his teammate Benedetti, Trek Segafredo Jasper Stoyven and Norway's Vigard Bren of Fortuneo, vital concept with the other two riders in that four-man break. They built a nice lead before Dimension Data started to bring it in. Um, I'm not sure why they chased quite so hard knowing that the, there was a hill at the finish that Mark Cavendish was unlikely to defend his yellow jersey on. There was a crash around the midway point in the stage with Alberto Contador hitting the floor for the second day in a row. Benedetti dropped out of the lead group with around 25 kilometres to go and the last three riders worked really well together and the gap was still more than two minutes with 10 kilometres to go on an uncategorised climb which caught us a bit by surprise and perhaps caught the riders by surprise. They looked like they'd run out of steam but then Stuyven accelerated hard and got a gap on his own. He was still clear at the bottom of the last hill but was eventually caught with 500 metres to go and then it was a bit like the finish flesh will own at least in the sense that the riders who were at the front were the sort of riders you see at that Belgian classic Peter Sagan won uh, he won ahead of Julian Alaphilippe Alejandro Valverde and Dan Martin have to mention the work done by Tinkoff's Roman Kreuziger for Sagan on the final climb the big GC news other than Alberto Contador losing 48 seconds was that there was a late disaster for BMC's Richie Port. he punctured on a fast sweeping downhill with about 4 kilometres to go and lost 1 minute 45 those two weren't the only riders to lose a bit of time. Vincenzo Nibali and Thibaut Pino gave away 11 seconds. Geraint Thomas lost 24. Ilnur Zakarin lost 41. Just a mention for Michael Morkoff and Sam Bennett, who both finished a long way down, uh, almost a quarter of an hour and over a quarter of an hour, and they looked in a real state when uh, they crossed the line. So the state of play today, Peter Sagan's in yellow at the Tour for the first time. He's also got the green jersey, which will be worn by Mark Cavendish. Jasper Stuyven is in the polka dots, and Julian Alaphilippe is in white. So I think in part one, we're going to talk about the stage. Uh, part two, Peddler de Charme, with uh, somebody that you mentioned there featuring in that, perhaps. And in part three, we're going to look at a bit more at these overall contenders and, and what happened with them. We've got interviews with... 
uh, with Paul Voss, with Dan Martin, with Tommy Alta Slachter, with Sean Yates on Alberta Contador, with Richie Port. Goodness me, I mean, we'll be here. We're going to miss the no, France game. Be Sorry, Francois. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. But um, it's um, and, oh, and the Free Boss File. How could I forget? We've got the Free Boss File, and the second instalment. Um, so Peter Sagan, he won the stage, uh, and. Uh, it's, it's a while since he's even won a stage. I mean, that was the sort of stage he won a lot of in 2012, wasn't it? Um, and always with a, a very colourful, exuberant celebration. And there wasn't one today. Well, because he <laughs> he pretended he, he, he you know he was racing for third place. He, but it looks very strange. That's to obviously me. a secret, isn't it? Yeah, well, maybe that's the way to do it. You know, but probably probably the, the, he hired now uh, Kreuziger to to tell him that you know we're sprinting for third place and that's how it goes. Now, I mean, he said at the finish and he repeated many times that he, he really thought there were still two guys in the front. So why did he uh, sprint the way he did? And why did he? Oh, so do you not do you don't do you not believe him? No, I don't believe it at all. Because I mean, wh- why? If if there were actually two guys in the front, why would have uh, Kreuziger done such you know such a hard work in in the in the last you know steep part of the climb just for for third place? I can't believe that. I don't think you know you waste uh, Kreuziger uh, force and, and especially when Condor is slipping out the back at the no, same time. Exactly. So so to me, it, this is bullshit. But I mean, this is bullshit. <laughs> this this the second way. That, that is, you, we, we like we like the way it, you know he bullshits us and. <laughs> uh, he, 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 did, he did it again. He, he, he probably bullshitted his, his rivals sorry, as well. Sorry, sorry about the swearing iTunes. No, no, are you okay? You know, I, I'm French, so it's 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 uh, you know. It sounds I, I don't know. I'm sophisticated. Yeah, I do, I do, <laughs> exactly. I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm saying. But no, that, I mean, it, it, it's maybe because we're on a ro- horse racing track, you know, and it, it smells a little bit of a, of the word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I I took him at his word. Maybe I'm just more naive. You know, you, you've been around a lot longer than. Me, Francois, no, 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 did, did it really look like he, he was sprinting for, for third place? Uh, well, I mean, Sagan, he is obviously going for green jersey as well, so there are valuable points in the line for third place. Um, I also thought at one point that he kind of lost it. Philippe looked like he was going to get it. Sagan dropped back a bit, and then he came again. But I won. It was so, almost so like an sprinting for, for third place. You, you beat uh, Alaphilippe, who's very gifted in this, this uh, kind of uh, races, and you beat uh, Valverde to third place, and Dan Martin easily. So you know, you just make a, a second-rate uh, effort, and you beat these guys. No, I, I, can't, I really can't believe that. I'm with Francois here. <laughs> really? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, like you say, I mean, with Kreuziger doing all of that work, Contador going out the back, they would have seen guys up the road. I mean, it wasn't dead straight, but they would have seen the motorbike, certainly, or they would have seen some sign that there was something up the road. And unless Sargon was... Uh, um, no. Well, let's, let's hear from one of the protagonist animators in the final stages, Tommy Alta Slagter on the climb. Well, it's a really vicious attack. What came from quite far back, rode extremely well and really did, did a lot of damage, strung them out. You know, probably there were guys, you know, Pino, uh, Nibali, perhaps that was the moment they slipped out. Let's hear from uh, Tommy Alta Slagter, who Lionel spoke to at the finish. A very impressive performance in the final there, but not quite enough to hold off the stampeding peloton. No, no, I, th- I have to say uh, the effort was good, but uh, I think it was a little bit too far from the finish. And uh, you need quite a lot of luck with that, but... Uh, Yeah, I think it was more or less my only chance to do something because it opened up and just at that moment I went and maybe if you wait it never opens up and uh, you can't pass. So, yeah, it's a pity it uh, doesn't get a result but uh, I'm satisfied with the leg so far. Was there a sense in the bunch that that Jasper Steven might stay away? I mean, it was looking really good. Yeah, to be honest, uh, I really thought the last 10k when he had more than one and a half minute maybe that uh, he would probably going to make it but yeah then you see how strong the bunch is in the in the Tour de France and yeah it's ridiculous <laughs> it all worked out okay for Pierre Rolland because he was up there at the front I believe as he came over the line what was the plan today were you given a bit of leeway to try something if you felt good yeah that was more or less the plan we um, number one was to st- to to bring him safe to the finish without any time gaps and then the second one was to go with me uh, to do a result and uh we didn't succeed in that, but the rest was, was going fine. And lastly, do you have your eyes on another stage later this week, maybe? I will have a look in the book uh, when, I, when I get into the bus, day by day. 
I was impressed with Slagter. It reminded me of his performance at Paris Nice a couple of years ago, and I thought from there he'd kick on. And this is the ideal sort of finish for him. Um, there's another couple in later in the week, I think, that might suit him just as well. Um, but it was interesting him having that little bit of leeway when Pierre Roland is presumably aiming for a high overall position and, and rode extremely well today and, as and well. Did actually, ride well, he was yeah. 12th today, which is extremely. Good, good performance from him. Uh, let's also hear from Dan Martin. I spoke to Dan Martin at the finish. He was fourth, um, very, very chipper at the finish, laughing and joking with Marcel Kittel. We'll hear in the interview why that was. Here's Dan Martin. Fourth on the stage, um, Peter Sagan didn't realise he was sprinting for the win. I take it you knew that, that the win was at stake there. Yeah, we got told on the radio that the track guy was coming back, and of course I saw him. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just a um, strange stage because obviously nobody bit of poker going on nobody really wanted to chase for the stage use a little energy and when you've got two of the favorites for the stage you've got gc riders i guess that's what happens you know so but yeah we uh we didn't really know it, it was a kind of a climb that on paper didn't really suit me and drew it in but obviously if it goes full gas up any climb it's gonna be hard so that's what happened we went so hard at a bit that it took the legs off a lot of guys and yeah i think we had the headwind there julian maybe misjudged it it was like a slow motion race from where i was sitting it was uh yeah, Julian just uh, misjudged the finish, like the headwind on the line, and yeah, unfortunately Sagan just got over him. You know. How did you feel in the in the you know you're obviously strong to be up there, and as you say, it was very fast. There was a real selection there. How, how were you actually feeling? Yeah, I feel really good. I mean, it's uh, I started, tried to stay as relaxed as possible all day, and obviously there was a lot of stress in the tour, and everybody's fighting from position all day. But I tried to teach the treat today like a one-day race, and just try and aim for the victory rather than thinking of the GC and. So I think I saved a lot of energy during the stage by not really being involved in the fight for position and kind of trying to relax as much as possible, being at the front, but not not using any energy just to make up those extra... Like, so it's... Yeah, I mean, uh, and Marcel did a great... <laughs> Marcel moved me to the front with 10k to go, and that shows a true team there, you know? How yeah. did he, what, just take you through the peloton or give you a push or what happened? Yeah, it was like one line. It just gave me a really, really like, moved me up about 100 places in one, in one slingshot, you know? Just like, just freaking rode as hard as he could and moved me on his wheel and... Yeah, I mean, uh, it kind of sums up this team, is there? What strikes me, um, seeing Dan Martin and Julian Alaphilippe both up there, seeing Kreuziger and Sagan working so well together, and even seeing Bora Argon put two riders in the brakes two days running, that's no accident. Um, you know, teams are using their brains quite well to, um, you know, work in tandem or work in small groups. There's, a lo- there's signs that there's a lot more organisation going on. I think on the in. sport has changed enormously. Really and has, we'll hear yeah. later from Rolf Aldag talking about sprint trains and so on, just how much it's changed even in the last decade or less than a, a decade. But Julien Alaphilippe uh, was highly fancied for today, Francois. He uh, is obviously a hugely exciting talent. Um, uh, we had your 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 countryman Seb Piquet on the other day, and he was mm-hmm. tipping Alaphilippe for this stage. Uh, he was disappointed, I think, wasn't he, not to win? Oh yeah, yeah, he was. He was really. I mean, he said uh, he said I must be satisfied with that. He said, you know, well, the man who beat me is, um, you know, had, had a rainbow jersey uh, on his back, so so I, I can't be, uh, you know, I can't be disappointed. But it, it you know, his face <laughs> said exactly the opposite. You you could really tell that it it, it really marked that uh, stage down as the one he wanted to win, uh, and he was. That's great, you know, to see a guy who's 22, uh, who's uh, you know, so. So gifted, so it, f- from his first pro year, you know, he, w- he was up there with the best, and 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 uh, no complex at all. It's also uh, something new that young riders that don't have that sort of respect, you know, for for classics, for the, for their elders. And uh, Ala Philippe is shot to 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 almost instant fame last last season in, in the the Arnold Classics, and and th- this guy really, the, I, I I wrote it in my, uh, you know, we all write previews on the ahead of the race, and, and, and there's a very very interesting. French generation, as we as we know, and the, the good thing about Alain Philippe is we really don't know where uh, where it stands. I mean, okay, he's a great rider for classics for flesh Wallon type classic, but can he do any better? I mean, he won the Tour of California twice, was six in the Dauphiné. So, what, what what are his actual limits? What what sort of a rider is he? We don't know. And what sort of character is he, uh, Francois? Because he spent some time as an amateur with the Armée de Terre. 
team, mm-hmm. the army, the French army team. His younger brother, Brian Alaphilippe, mm-hmm. is in that team. That's I right. was at Trobro Leon in April and, and chatted to Jimmy Casper, who won a tour stage, I think, in 2006 mm-hmm. in Strasbourg. He's the only member of that whole organisation that isn't a soldier. He's, uh, he's a civilian. But he was saying how easy it is to manage that group because they've got a sort of ingrained discipline. So is that something that Julian Philippe, uh, Alaphilippe has also got? It is very disciplined, but in a, in a same time, it's very straightforward. Like, you know, sometimes when, when rookies, you know, uh, appear on, on the pro circuit, you, you, that, that's the kind of shyness or you, uh, re, they're a little bit reserved. And Alain Philippe's always been very straightforward, you know, very ambitious, very, uh, well, in a way, a, a little bit military, you know, what, uh, you know, like how the soldiers do, do, do talk when they go straight to the point, man. And mm-hmm. uh, Alain Philippe is a little bit like that, no nonsense uh, type of guy. Uh, He's not maybe as exuberant as other guys, or he's not as probably as funny and smile, smiling like, as Warren Barguil or other guys. But you know, you, you, he, he really there is something in the way he talks uh, uh, of, of you know, you know, of, of the, the old French champions, uh, simple, straightforward, very ambitious, and and straight to the point. So uh, we're, we're not used to this kind of guy. He's not. Anymore. He's not a whimsical flaneur. To, to <laughs> no. quote, uh, no. To quote Daniel Freib, who I think used that. Um, expression for Warren Barguil, mm. a whimsical flaneur. I, I wouldn't, you know, he, he wouldn't be. Uh, he could be you know, a pedaleur de charme, but but he's, he, you know, he's, he's, it's not. He's not that type of rider. He's much more. Not a pedaleur de charme. You know, no. Are we ruling him out already? <laughs> um, speaking of Daniel Freib, let's hear the instalment two of the Free Boss file. Over to you, Daniel. Bonsoir, chaps. I still haven't really seen you, have I? My long-lost podcasting companion. That is a bit of a lie. I did spot Lionel today, about 50 metres away. He was busy interviewing Charlie Wigalius, the Cannondale director sportif. He'd adopted the kind of posture that he usually adopts when he's within ordering distance of his next local speciality, so it's best not to not to disturb him at those moments. No doubt we'll catch up probably tomorrow morning. Um, I saw. I also saw the Buffalo Richard Moore charging around um, somewhere around the finish this evening. Again, too far away, unfortunately, for me to stop. But again, I'll catch up with Rich later. I'll, I'll give him a call just in case he's feeling lonely, neglected. Anyway... Yesterday, my day really revolved around Mark Cavendish. It did again today. I saw him at the start this morning. He was obviously delighted. I think he was a bit peeved last night when someone stole his helmet in the press conference or after the press conference. He couldn't locate his helmet. Um, But he was in better mood this morning, as you'd expect. He he had the yellow jersey. And um, he was pretty philosophical at the finish as well. He really didn't expect to to keep the yellow jersey. Probably lost a bit more time than he thought he might uh, and has probably really relinquished all chances of regaining the yellow jersey over the next few days thanks to time bonuses but he was happy enough i think this evening um it was it was one day in paradise really in the yellow jersey and another common theme from yesterday yesterday i was um standing next to mark cavendish's agent um when he came over the line triumphantly and today i found myself in very close proximity to peter sagan's agent giovanni lombardi when Sagan came over the line triumphant and um, Giovanni was actually at the Dimension Data bus this morning, he doesn't have any riders who ride for Dimension Data but he simply wanted to go on the bus to congratulate Mark Cavendish um, he, was also, he was also sharing the, the details of a bit of a, a standoff that has developed with Alexander Vinokurov, the Astana team manager I think most people know that they have been in negotiations, so there's certainly been talks about Peter Sagan moving to Astana, which seemed to have completely broken down. Giovanni confirmed that he has not spoken to Vinokurov, the Astana manager, for two or three weeks, and um, he said the onus is on Vinokurov to contact him again, but we also suspect that the, the deal to take Sagan probably to what is currently Bora Argon 18 might well be done. Um, just on Sagan's stage win, what really impressed me today was just how cool-headed he was in the finale. We've almost lampooned him in the past, his, his tactical inability, um, his tactical incompetence. He has found all sorts of, of innovative methods of losing stages when it looked like he should have won them. Um, today, he showed that he has learned a few things. He found himself on the front in the wind at, I think, about four, 500 metres to go, maybe slightly closer to the line. And then he 
took his foot off the gas, pulled back and got back in the wheels only to sprint again. And that was really the, the crucial move, the crucial tactical move that allowed him to win and take the first yellow jersey of his career. So Sagan goes from strength to strength. He's already the most entertaining, flamboyant showman we've got in the sport. And um, I think any victory for, for Sagan is usually a good day for cycling. So that's my, what, what are you call it? Free boss file? Have I got music yet? Have I got my jingle? Eurosport, the home of cycling. And now, Pedaler du Charme. Thank you very much to Eurosport, who, along with Rafa, are sponsoring the cycling podcast. And Eurosport specifically are sponsoring our daily Pedaler du Charme award. Before we get on to that, um, we've got a kind of double header today. We should just uh, mention. Uh, the free boss file, which uh, he seems to be using as a bit of an excuse to, to, to have a pop at us. We'll have to get our revenge somehow. Ex- extraordinary. I mean, it, 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 there's no right of reply. Or maybe there is. Well, I think there is. This is it. Well, this is I it. mean, we haven't got time. We haven't got time. <laughs> no, it's already a packed episode. If we're going to lay into free boss, let's, let's, do it. Let's, let's keep that for a kilometre zero or something, <laughs> which starts tomorrow, incidentally, kilometre zero. So Monday to Friday in the mornings, kilometre zero. Uh, Peddler de Charme. Now uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, a lot of support yesterday for Paul Voss, and uh, he won it not on the basis of him being a, a friend of the podcast. And in fact, he tweeted on Saturday night after the Sage that he was listening to the podcast and heard himself being awarded Peddler de Charme, which put a smile on his face. Mm. I, I, went wa- I wonder what he thought when you nearly tried to take it away from him, Richard. Yeah, I <laughs> went and saw him this morning, and we glossed over that, actually. <laughs> didn't, didn't dwell on that. But anyway, I went to see him this morning, gave him his T-shirt, and here's what he had to say. Paul, well, must feel very nice to pull on this uh, non-team jersey. Yeah, it's a nice feeling. Yeah, it's like uh, nice material as well. So <laughs> you've been a professional for a long time, and you know you've been knocking at the door for something like this. I mean, it must be to be at the biggest race in the world and be in one of the one of the jerseys. It must be an incredible feeling. Yeah, it's it's nice. It's a it's a kind of reward. Like the last four years, I worked quite a lot in this team, and so it's nice to give myself a bit of a reward. And uh, even if it's made for just one or two days, but it's a nice feeling. Was it the plan yesterday? Was it a stage you looked at and thought there's an opportunity here? Uh, no, I didn't look that and I didn't fall the ball. But yeah, I got the, in the meeting told that I have to go for for the breakaway, and then yeah, I just made the best out of it. Did the news about the team on the Eva tour? You must have known about that for a while. But Zach, did that give you a, a little boost as well? It didn't give me an extra push. I mean, I'm here to show myself as well as so I'm still up for a contract. So um, of course, and today, or well, yesterday, was a perfect day to do that. Yeah. Mm. And of course, the more important jersey that you collect today is yeah. this one. And got my hand here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was listening last night to the podcast, and I was like, I was like really smiling <laughs> because when you said like I'm friend of the podcast, and then the others didn't believe it, so <laughs> I'm actually one there. Yeah, I know. So. We you're a paid up member of the po- uh, yeah, yeah. friend of the podcast. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, it's nice to get it. Yeah. How do you find time on the Tour de France to listen to to the podcast as well? Uh, I don't know. I'm just doing before I go to bed like while I do stretching or I don't want to watch TV so I'm not got better things to do no I'm just relaxing and then just listening to podcasts is sometimes quite interesting and uh, some bits to laugh so I definitely enjoy it yeah. excellent well congratulations well I mean is there some kind of record for somebody who has held the peddler to charm jersey from start to finish in a grand tour because not since Eddie Merckx wow well, <laughs> exactly I mean Paul Voss on the attack again didn't manage to keep hold of his king of the mountain jersey because uh, Stuyven was just a bit too hot for him on those early climbs but another strong day out for him yeah he was, did say he was going to wear his peddler to charm t-shirt under the polka dot jersey I can confirm that he didn't <laughs> uh, but I'm sure he will he's only to keep it nice wasn't he he's mm. be wearing it tonight Night, I'm sure. Um, so that a very, yeah, very another very strong showing from him today. There were other nominations today for Peddler de Charme, Tommy Vokler for being on bottle duty for his teammates. I think he caught a few people's eyes for his charming peddling while collecting bottles. Mm-hmm. I, I think you, you know what I heard. I mean, it's it's it's, it's one of those rumors you, you like to hear like, because, like the uh, because they uh, yeah. Well, m- maybe you're the same. Uh, you know, 
he lost time yesterday. He lost time again today. I mean, he wrote. He's always written at the back. But the, 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 apparently, the idea is that he's going to lose as much time as he can, so that he can go on a, on, on a breakaway on his own, and nobody will chase him because he's, he won't be any danger uh, for the overall. So it's a new tactic, so which he's is deliberately. Yeah, time. apparently. So it's a new strategy. You lose as much time as you can in the first like ten stages, and in the eleventh, you know, you are with, with a, a, a one hour. Day Deficit, you can go for it. Mm. Maybe that's what Alberto Contador is <laughs> doing as well. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, there a lot of nomination. Jasper Steven was a, a nomination he, just because he is a very stylish, mm. elegant, classy looking bike rider. Uh, he won Kern Brussels Kern this year with a similar kind of attack where the peloton just misjudged it and he stayed away and won it. But ultimately, our peddler de charme for today is somebody who was, who was captured on TV uh, on two occasions. Uh, pushing two of the crash victims from the first date, not teammates, but Sam Bennett, the Irishman, and uh, Michael Morkov, um, the the Dane. And uh, that was a a great bit of sportsmanship by Greg Henderson. So I went and spoke to him after the stage and told him that I'd be looking for him in the morning with a Peddler de Charme t-shirt. Here is what Greg Henderson had to say. Oh, I know what it's like, mate. (laughs) Felt sorry for them. Going out the the back when... uh you know, you ate shit yesterday in a big bunch sprint. I don't know exactly the feeling. They're not going out the back because they're bad bike riders. They're going out the back because they're injured. So I just thought I'd give them a little helping hand. Any other sort of good deeds performed today? Other riders that you help? Oh, mate, I'm just such a nice person. I help everyone. Well, Greg, um, you're definitely our overwhelming nomination today for Peddler de Charme. So I'll come and find you tomorrow morning and give you the Peddler de Charme t-shirt. Oh, beautiful. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. I mean, technically, Richard, uh, helping a rival um, rider on another team is against the rules for of professional cycling. Sake, well, I, mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to just. Pour, I don't want to pour. Uh, if we're going to be sticklers for the rules, in the Dan Martin interview earlier, he did tell us that Marcel Kittel gave him a hand sling and mm. moved him up. He said a hundred places. I mean, I know Kittel's a big guy with broad shoulders, wow. but that's a hell of a hand sling, isn't it? It is. Hundred yeah. places he moved him up, and technically that's not allowed either. But no, no. I don't. I mean, the, the, you know, Paul Voss listens to the podcast, but I don't think the commissars do. So we'll just keep that one. Keep that one to ourselves. He told us that in confidence anyway two strong peddlers to charm there yeah and i mean bennett and morkoff to be honest they needed all the help they could get because they were they look uh, in bits. poor but sam we, bennett we, yeah because I mean, last year was the same i mean last year he battled on and battled on he was lantern rouge for quite a while and you know to come again with great form he rode so well at the the criterium de dauphine he was up there with the best sprinters in the world you know, he had come here thinking he had a decent chance of a, of a stage win and maybe even on a day like today and uh, it, terrible luck for him. Awful. Yeah, yeah. I like Sam Bennett very much because he's a different type of sprinter. You know, he's not like the, the muscular. He's not. He's not, he's not a gripe. He's not a gorilla. He's, he's 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 rather lean. He's rather you know diminutive and and is is. is just what we call velocity, you know, and mm. is, is natural speed. And I like the way he sprints, is is different and unfortunately unlucky. Mm. We got in trouble a little bit yesterday for not mentioning Dan McClay, who was ninth on the opening stage and, you know, rides for a small team, first time at a race like this, and that was a, a, a very, very strong performance from him. We'll catch up with him one day. Just on Bennett and Morkoff, though, the tour, it strikes me, it's all. It's the only event in the world where people will go beyond and beyond their limits mm-hmm. to stay in, and they'll hope against hope that the bruises can um, start to repair, um, and they will battle on, but it, it's horrible watching them fall apart, really, when, when you see up close just how sort of ragged they look. Um, and, you know, even Alberto Contador today, you know, um, we'll come on and talk about that in the in the third part but there's a lot of wishful thinking going on I think you know even this early in the race yep um, let's before we go on to part three just hear another little trailer for one of our friend specials um, we release 11 friend specials throughout the year I think we've released seven so far this year so every night we're playing a little clip to tempt those of you who are not already friends of the podcast to become a friend of the podcast and tonight I think we're hearing a little clip from our most recent one which we released on the eve of the tour and it was about Operation Puerto, the doping scandal that broke on the eve of the tour 10 years ago. Friday 30th of June, the eve of the Grand Depart, was to turn into one of the most shocking and dramatic days in the tour's 103-year history. The Guardia Civil had seized over 200 bags of blood or plasma. Puerto just seemed different and bigger and uglier right from the beginning. 
Jan Ulrich and Ivan Basso came to the Tour de France as the two big favourites to win it, but they're both out before the race has even started. I actually thought in my naivety that the peloton would have thought, OK, yeah, this is, might have taken a lesson from that. Obviously, Puerto exploded and I was like, oh my God, it's going on even more than ever. Become a friend of the podcast for 2016. For £10, you'll have access to our friends specials. To sign up, visit www.thecyclingpodcast.com. You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride. With the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. See rafa.cc for more information. Yes, thank you indeed to Rafa um, and their support is enabling us to be here and to give you these daily free podcasts. So thank you very much indeed to them. Uh, I did mention on yesterday's podcast that they are also covering the race in their own way. Um, if you go on rafa.cc and uh, you'll find the, a section called More Than a Race and every day they are posting tour-themed stories. Today actually is one with Paul Smith, the designer, on his cycling style icons. We actually have an interview with Paul Smith uh, in one of our Kilometer Zeros coming up as well. So have a look at that. Every day it's something of, of interest on uh, rafa.cc. And uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed to them. We're extremely grateful. So... The overall contenders. There's a bit of um, a bit of bit of disruption there today. Poor old Alberto Contador off off his bike again. Well, yeah. I mean, I spoke to Sean Yates, um, the Tinkoff Sports Director, this morning. His first word, one word answer about how Contador was uh, just seemed to be a little bit of a diversionary tactic because just as I walked away from speaking to Sean Yates I saw on Twitter um, that Contador was quoted as saying he barely slept a wink um, last night after his crash so this is Sean Yates uh, hoping for the best I think for Alberto Contador how is Alberto Contador after a night's sleep fine fine I mean obviously not ideal for a good night's sleep having your back cut up but yeah you got through the night today's another day a bit sore I guess a bit uncertain, you know, obviously today it will be a tough final where the GC guys will be going full gas. So it's in the back of your mind always, I think, that maybe it's going to be a handicap, but I'm sure he will deal with it. Once he gets moving, I guess he'll he'll know, um, but no further information on what the damage was? No, it's just skin, skin. I mean, obviously yesterday he finished the stage fine, just mentally is obviously not ideal Have to deal with that. You know, the weather's not super duper, I get a bit of dirt in it, you know, I need to wash it again. So, just inconvenient, really. They're tough fellas, these skinny little guys, aren't they? You don't get, get much tougher than Alberto, but yeah, as I said, it's not ideal because, yeah, your body, although nothing is broken, it's still an, in, an injury which takes strength to, re, to repair. Luckily, apart from t- t- today's final, it's a little while until the crucial stages, so he will have time to recover, and I'm quite confident that. It won't be a big long-term problem. And really, Sean Yates' fears came true there because on that final climb, it was just a bit too much for Contador and he lost touch and he lost 48 seconds, which uh, is not disastrous, but it's not what you want if you're aiming for the yellow jersey in Paris. Is it? And it shows how much the crash has affected him already, you know, because that, that Contador is the sort of finish that would have suited a, a fit and informed Contador, wouldn't it? But these crashes really do take their toll. I think it's uh, it's a disaster for uh, for Alberto to be to be honest. I I, I heard what he said in Spanish in, uh, on the finish line, and it, it really sounded you know like you were talking of wish, wishful thinking a, a little bit earlier that he, he was saying, well, I must keep my morale. I'm, I must you know I'm I'm still standing, but in the same time he said I'm I'm very unhappy about the situation. He said it hurt. He actually crash on the other side this time so he said my both my legs are, are seriously touched i can't pedal the way i want uh it, it would be well it would be more or less okay if tomorrow it was not another long you know tricky stage while well, it's all flat but i mean that's not exactly mm. what he likes best and very very soon we're in the mountain even if it's not the high mountain but your is not it's not an easy ride so on the day when he should have been doing all right he will still be nursing his injuries so 
I'm, I'm, I'm afraid it's, it's already over for. Arbor. He's going to win the Vuelta, though, isn't he? <laughs> Maybe it sets know. up the Vuelta nicely. <laughs> Froome versus Contador, um, and and others as well. Actually, and Vuelta's looking pretty good. But we're at the Tour de France. You spoke to Richie Port, who also he punched about four and a half kilometres from the line, mm. which is probably the worst point to puncture, especially mm. on a stage like today, mm. where you know teams were really ripping it up at the front. Well, coming down that sweeping descent, he took a funny line, didn't he? And he's, it was clear he had a problem. Um, and obviously his back wheel was twitching away from him. Where's Simon Clark when you need him? Well, exactly. That's what happened in the Giro last year, wasn't it? When Port was riding for Sky and his good mate Simon Clark riding for another team gave him... Uh, some supporting, you know, assistance. Well, gave him a wheel. Like gave him a wheel. Think, yeah, yeah but, we're allowed to say that. Right, but yeah. it was. Uh, it's a bit more than a sort of yeah. uh, a shove up a hill or a hand sling, isn't it? But um, yeah, there was none of that today. The wheel change from the neutral service was not the best. I mean, the TV pictures it was cut almost away. as bad as, as a BMC uh, wheel change. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's the problem with neutral service, isn't it? That the wheels are not, you know, frames are different uh, thicknesses, and mm. you know they're not all they're they're not always set. Whereas on a team car, that they know exactly the equipment is 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 they are ready to be put in the in the bike. Yeah, um, the TV director neutral service is always a bit of a compromise. The TV director cut away from the pictures of the poor mechanic struggling uh, just to put him out of his misery. I think. I mean, it was going on and on, and Port, to his very great credit. As we've seen before, I mean, I think, remember Geraint Thomas when he punctured, when he was just about to win the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Games. 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 I know, yeah, well, but, you know, he, yeah. he, had a, he had a problem and he was, you know, the model of sort of professional calm and uh, didn't sort of get on the mechanics back about it. And Port was very much the same, or at least the you bit and I we would saw. Be like that in oh, that I mean, could you well, imagine? Could you imagine <laughs> the blood's pumping you four kilometres from the finish? That, that You've got vein on your forehead would oh, literally I mean, be throbbing it, out, out of your. It would be like skin. It would be like uh, when I miss lunch or, or dinner. It would be yeah. as bad I mean, as that. A bit, a bit like your demeanour at the buffet today. <laughs> yeah, no, no, there's nothing worse than missing the buffet. You know, but, uh, well, we, it today's to buffet was worth missing, though, wasn't it? it? It was much better when you left. Because they brought back some pudding and stuff. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> we missed the pudding, Richard. Um, well, you said I spoke to Richie Port. I didn't really. There was a right old scrum around the BMC bus, and I got shoved the microphone under his mouth. And I was really impressed with how calmly he was taking it. Um, let's listen to a little bit of what Richie Port said after the stage. I mean, it's a disaster. I don't know what really you can do. I mean, just move on, I suppose. But, I mean, we're going that fast um, in terms of the bike change but it all just happened so quickly that uh, by the time Bergard got back to me the bunch was gone anyhow I mean it's kind of like last year in the Giro um, minus the two minute penalty but it probably would have been quicker to take the two minute penalty than the wheel change that I got anyhow you know it's far from over yet I mean maybe in the third week if we keep it all together I might be able to go off after a stage two the end of the day, I guess we just uh, pretend like it never happened and wait for the mountains to come. So that was Richie Port, and just and finally tonight we want to sort of look at Mark Cavendish's day in yellow. And um, we spoke to a few people at the start, Lionel, didn't we, who have been involved or are involved in Cavendish's career, um, just to gauge what Saturday's stage win meant in the context of Cavendish's whole career. I mean, Francois, I don't know what you thought. Um, it was. A clean sprint, a fair sprint, where we've always thought that in that kind of circumstance, Kittle will always win. And yet, Cavendish kind of rolled back time, didn't he? I might be wrong about it, but even before the start of the tour, I had the impression that uh, Cavendish was, was much more relaxed than he had been for a very long time. I mean, uh, his days with Quickstep was not as happy as it could have been. His days with Sky, oddly enough, were not as happy as they could have been. And he really looks happy to be well with Rancho, Isol, you know. Isol has got a very, very strong and good influence on, on him. And, 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 well, okay, he, he repeated as a motto his, his, his phrase about, you know, uh, dimension data and, and uh, you know, ending 5,000 bikes to the to, Quebec to, to, charity, to, to yeah. kids. Yeah. But, but, but it, it didn't sound so uh, entirely uh, untrue. I mean, I, I really have the impression he feels uh, he, he's coming to a stage in his career when he has nothing else, nothing to prove. He's probably more relaxed, probably just happier in, in, in this team. And, and, and I think these little things matter. 
in the end, you know. And and to me, it, it, his win was was really, uh, uh, you know, impressive. And I, I, there was no discussion at all about it. And I wouldn't be surprised if he won a sprint tomorrow again. Let's well, Richard, as much as I want to delay Francois, say can't watch France's glorious victory over Iceland this evening. It should have been France versus England, of course, shouldn't it? Um, had England not been uh, totally hopeless. Have. Scotland. It could have been Scotland versus Iceland. Let's not let's not stray in a, in into an the al- Scotland. In an alternate universe. <laughs> Scotland. Alternate universe. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Well, I think we we should probably wrap things up. Shouldn't we? Should. we? We'll be back. Comet to Zero starts tomorrow. First episode is a, a day in the life of uh, of us on the race, and um, we, we're trying to sort of to explain what goes on from morning. Till, from the alarm going off till last thing at night. Um, it's right like the Waltons, isn't it? At last mm. thing at night. Night, mm. Lionel. Um, but anyway, that, that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, please subscribe to the Cycling Podcast on iTunes to guarantee that you get the podcast as soon as it's released. And if you feel like it, leave a review. A positive one, preferably. Um, leave a review on iTunes. I think that helps. But we're sailing. We're flying high in the iTunes chart. We're number one at the moment in the iTunes sports chart. So thank you very much to everybody who's listening. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Francois, and hope you can join us again soon. Merci, les gars, as we say in French.